praise God together and sing. I hope you're ready to sing. We are ready. We've had one service already. It was fantastic, and uh, I think you guys can beat it, though. Let's sing loud this morning for Jesus.
the battle is over. Jesus, in your name we rise. The glory is yours. The glory is yours. Oh God, the glory is yours. The kingdom is come and the battle is over. Jesus, in your name we rise. The glory is yours. The glory is yours. Nobody beside you there has ever been anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you there will never be anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you, there will never be anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you, there will never be anyone, anything like you. There's no one like our God, amen? We look to the sun, we look to Jesus today this day and every day. Amen. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on a Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun. Oh, we 
Colossians chapter 2 as we get it. This to say about the cross of Christ. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Sing of the wondrous cross of Jesus.
can have a seat, please. Now this is handy, it's a tool, I'll warm it up for you. I always heard kidney stones were bad, and I'm finding out firsthand for about the last week. Uh, I wouldn't wish it on my almost worst enemy. I'm struggling with the worst enemy part. Recently, uh, Carl and I went over to uh, Williamstown, Kentucky. As most of you probably know, some of you have been there. That's where the replica of the Ark is at. And uh, it's 450 feet long, just like the Bible says. 45 feet high, 60 feet wide. That's in cubits. and uh, None of us would understand, except for Mark, maybe, in the cubits. So uh, I was amazed at how big it was. I always thought of it, yeah, football field and a half long, 45 feet high, 60 foot wide, that's, that's, that's big. But until you actually see it, you don't really understand how big it is. I was also amazed at the work Noah did how he did it with the equipment with, that we have now. If I remember right, it took him a couple years to build it. And it took Noah a lot longer than that. Go 
got lost here. There we go. The ark saved Noah and his family just like the cross saves us today. In 1 Peter 3, 18 through 21, it says, For Christ also suffered once for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism now that saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. By what Jesus did for us on the cross, should we choose to accept it, which most of us have. If you haven't, I invite you to do so. We are saved from the penalty of our sins. Until you look deep into your own life and possibly some other lives, we really don't understand, like the ark, how big that load of sin was from the time God put man on earth to now and the end of earth, that's a pretty big load. I know it is for me. What a burden. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for many blessings you've given us, for the forgiveness of sins, for what Jesus did for us. That huge burden of sins that blocked out the sun that day. We just pray for forgiveness and pray that you would help us to be like we should be. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's pray. Our Father, our Lord in heaven, I just pray that you would be with us through this week. Be with Mark as he brings us a message. Help us to apply it to our lives and go out of here, change people. Pray for all the folks who couldn't make it today, whether it's physical or mental. Just pray that you would be with them and heal them. Heal those that are on the road and those that are in an accident. And we pray, man. And good morning. The series of sermons we're doing is called "Just Ask," and it's about prayer. It's a real simple thing. When you what you need, just ask God. It's about communicating with God, and how important that is to us. This disclaimer: 
This is not a series. Everybody look right here. Everybody look right here. This is not a series on how to get what you want from God, and neither is life. Okay? Are, are, we, pre, are we clear about that? It's not about that. It's not about how can I manipulate God so I can get God to do what I want. In fact, if you can manipulate God, then he's not a God worthy of your worship. And we want a, a God who's a big God who knows what he's doing on his own. But the flip side of that is we've all experienced frustration in prayer. And we ask for something, we beg for something, we ask over and over again. We talked about that last week. And then it still doesn't happen. And there's, there's almost some trauma with that, and it's, it's just difficult. So I want to do today, I want to tell you a little Bible story out of the book of Genesis. A little scary every time we get to Genesis because there's some crazy stuff in that book. Stories about a guy named Isaac and his wife named Rebecca, and they had twin boys. Congratulations to the twins up front. And they had twin boys, and the boys' names were Esau and Jacob. Now, the older was Esau, and they named him that because Esau, the Hebrew word for Esau, sounds like hairy. And when the boy was born, he was hairy. Okay. Our babies are mainly bald when they're born, our family, but this was a hairy baby. And so they called him Harry. And the other boy was Jacob, and they called him... When he was born, he was second born, but just right on the heels of his brother Esau. In fact, he was holding his brother's heel. Okay? And so they called him Jacob, which means heel holder or supplanter. has the idea of deception in the name. Well, the boys grew up, and this is bad, but the, Isaac had a favorite, and Re, Rebecca had a favorite. Isaac loved Esau, because he was strong, he was a rugged man's man, he liked to go out hunting and fishing and carrying on, he wore the, rode the four-wheeler, he did all that kind of, all that outdoorsy, man, manly kind of thing. They had four-wheelers, trust me, they had wheels at least, surely by then. Jacob, on the other hand, was mama's boy, okay, and he was, uh, he was good in the kitchen, and, and nothing wrong with a man cooking once in a while. Doesn't taste good, but nothing wrong with it. Well, Jacob can make it taste good. His mama loved him. He, he was just a little softer. Okay, and so there was, by the way, if you have children, I do not recommend that mom and dad each choose a favorite. Okay, it doesn't play well. And you can read the book of Genesis all about that. So the boys get a little bigger, and mama's got her boy, and daddy's got her boy, his boy. One day, Esau's out hunting like he's prone to do. He's out, out in the woods. And when he comes in, his brother Jacob has made lunch, and he's made a beautiful red stew. And the Bible calls it lentil soup. I, I'm thinking red beans and rice, and it was ar aromatic. Didn't think I knew that word. It was fragrant. It smelled so good. And Esau said, man, I'd like to have a bowl of that soup. And <laughs> Jacob, I love this, says, what would you give for it? Any siblings? Is that not funny to any other people? Let me set that up again, okay? Esau's out hunting. He comes in the house. His brother's got a pot of soup, uh, a big bowl of chili. And Esau said, well, I'd like to have a bowl of soup. And brother said, what would you give for it? Anybody not see the humor in that? Sometimes it's a storyteller. So it's on me, okay? <clears throat> and here's what he said. You know what he said? I want that soup so I'm about to die. I've been hunting all day. I haven't had a thing to eat. I'm about to die. I need that soup. And what would you give for it? <clears throat> would you give your birthright for it? Now, a birthright in those days went to the eldest son. That's what Esau deserved. It involved two-thirds of the inheritance. Okay? So the family wealth is going to be centered on Esau, the two-thirds of the inheritance. He also is going to be the one who is the leader of the family. And Jacob says, would you sell me your birthright for a bowl of soup? Not a good bargain. Okay? And Esau says, well, I don't know what, good, what my good birthright is going to do me. I'm going to die if I don't get the soup. So, yeah, I'll give you the birthright. And so Jacob steals, deceives, whatever you want to say, buys the birthright from his brother Esau. Fast forward a couple of years uh, down the road in Genesis chapter 27. It starts out this way. Isaac was old and had a hard time seeing anymore. Okay. I think that's typical. If you don't help, this would last a long time. <laughs> I, I think it's typical. It, it's uh, cataracts. Uh, they, they didn't take cataracts off in those days. They just saw through a cloud. And so that's what's going on. And he said, I'm old, and I can't see. And he says to his son Esau, I'll tell you what. I know I'm going to die pretty soon, so here's what I want you to do. 
go out in the field and hunt me some game. Get you, you, you're a great hunter. You go bring some game in. You prepare it with spicy like you bring it in, that Cajun flavor. You got to help all you can in church. You got to bring that in, and, and I'll have, and after you feed me, I'm going to give you the blessing. Now, the blessing in those days was kind of a prophetic utterance from the leader of the family, passing on a blessing to the next. And so they're ready for that. Uh, he goes out to hunt. But meanwhile, Rebecca, the mother who loves Jacob, have I lost you? Is at the door listening to all this, and she says to Jacob, Your brother's about to get the blessing. Here's what we'll do you go get a goat out of the pen. I'll, I'll cook that goat up just like your brother cooks it. We'll take it in. And you, you tell Dad, here, Dad, I've been hunting, and I, I'm Esau, and I brought it in. And <clears throat> Jacob says, well, Dad will never believe I'm Esau. I mean, he's hairy. He smells like the earth. I mean, it's, it's, he's never going to believe that. Our voices are not the same. She said, don't worry about it. When you kill the goat, I'm going to put the goat skin, make uh, sleeves for you, one on each sleeve, put some goat, goat skin right behind your neck, so when he reaches up to hug you, He'll feel the goat skin. He'll know it's you. Well, he'll know it's Esau. So they carry it out. He brings in supper, and he said, hey, Dad, I got lunch. He said, boy, how did that happen so quickly, Esau? And Jacob says, well, God was with me. Now, if you're going to lie, you might as well really lie, right? God was with me, and, and here it is. And he said, is it really you, Esau? Because it sounds like Jacob. He said, no, I'm, I'm really your older son, Esau. And finally, he said, oh, it just doesn't seem right. And, and he said, tell you what, g- give me a big hug. And so he goes over and gives his dad a hug. And when Jacob, when Isaac reaches up and grabs Jacob behind the neck, he feels that fur. And he smells the goat. He goes, oh, it's Esau. <laughs> They're selling that kind of cologne in different places today, what they call that. Musk, I don't know what that is. but it's. <clears throat> and so he gives him the blessing, Genesis 27. Here's the blessing that he gives to his, the one he thinks is the oldest son, but actually the younger son. Verse 28, from the dew of heaven, the richness of earth, may God always give you abundant harvests of grain and bountiful new wine. May many nations become your servants. May they bow down to you. May you be the master over your brothers. And remember, this is prophecy now. And may your mother's son bow down to you. All who curse you'll be cursed. All who bless you will be blessed. You're going to be the leader. It's going to be great. Meanwhile, Esau walks in just as Jacob is leaving. He says, Dad, I got some lunch ready for you. And dad says, "Uh uh-oh, I've been deceived. I've been fooled. Esau says, well, I need a blessing anyway. So verse 39, finally Isaac said to him, well, here's your blessing. You'll live far away from the richness of the earth and away from the dew of heaven above, and you will live by your sword and you will serve your brother. When you decide to break free, you'll shake the yoke from his neck, from your neck. From that time on, Esau hated Jacob. I think he had before too, but it's worse now because their father had given Jacob the blessing. And Esau began to scheme. I will soon be mourning my father's death. Then I will kill my brother, Jacob. A little family story for bedtime. Okay. So Jacob goes off, and he, so he's scared to death that his brother Esau is going to kill him. So he goes off to the land where his uncle Laban lives, and he marries too many wives. Okay. And we heard this story a couple weeks ago, Rachel, Leah, Zilpah, and a couple, yeah, too many wives, and has 11 children, and by his own deceptive practices, hard work and deception, which is part of his nature, he amasses a fortune. And then in Genesis 31, 3, God says to Jacob, return to the land of your father and grandfather and your relatives there, and I will be with you. Now, that's the good news. But the bad news is Esau will be there too. And so Jacob is scared to death to go home. On the way there, he hears that Esau is coming to meet him with 400 armed men. Now, that's not a welcome party. Okay? That's not, glad to see you back home. That's a war party. And so Jacob is scared. He divides his, his kids up in different places. And he didn't want them all together. And here's what happens. Genesis 32, verse 9. Jacob prays. Wouldn't you pray? Everybody prays. Right? Everybody prays. Hello? Everybody prays, especially when there's 400 armed men coming at you. And so he prays. O God of my grandfather Abraham, and the God of my father Isaac, O Lord, you told me. So he's praying as God's promises back. You told me, return to your land and your relatives, and you promised me I'll treat you kindly. I'm not worthy of all the unfailing love and faithfulness you've shown to me, your servant. When I left home and crossed the Jordan River, I own nothing except a walking stick. Now my household fills two large camps. O Lord, please rescue me from the hand of my brother Esau. 
I'm afraid he's coming to attack me, along with, his, along with my wives and children. But you promised me, I will surely treat you kindly, and I'll multiply your descendants until they become as numerous as a sands on the seashore, too many to count. And so he sends everybody away, and now Jacob's all alone. And now, now the story gets weird. Okay. <laughs> all right, here we go. Chapter 32, verse 24. This left Jacob all alone in the camp. And a man came and wrestled with him. Who's that man? A man came and wrestled with him until dawn began to break. When the man saw that he could not win the match, or would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. He doesn't pull it. He just touches it and wrenches it out of its socket. The man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What's your name, the man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob. The man told him, from now on, you'll be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel. He was limping because of the injury to his hip, and he limped from that day forward. Now, that is a crazy story. A lot of questions. Who is this man? What, what, what man shows up in the middle of the night and wrestles all night long with Jacob? Uh, some commentators think it may be an angel, but the, most people believe it's really God coming in the flesh to wrestle with Jacob, and it's a symbol, of, symbolic of our prayer time. Why, why do you think it's God? Well, he has incredible power. With just a, a, a finger flick, he can take his hip out of socket. He says, let me go before dawn. Why? Well, because the Bible says, God says, you cannot look at me and live. You can't look at me and full in the face. And Jacob says, I've seen God. And we call this place Peniel. If he's wrestling against God, then why didn't, didn't God win? Well, God chose to wrestle with him and let him win. Now, why do we have to wrestle with God? Why do we have to persist in prayer? Why, why doesn't God just give us what we want the very first time we ask? Persisting in prayer it makes us see what we want, why we want it, Ultimately, it really changes us. But this much is obvious. God wants us to pray, and this is, a, this is symbolic of prayer. We, we, you ever feel like you're in a wrestling match with God in prayer? God, here's what I want, and I keep asking, and you, you're not doing what I'm asking. I mean, I, I know this is good, but I don't get, get where I get it. I'm going to give you five possible reasons why God does not answer your prayer. Now, they're not all true for everybody, but they're probably, some of these are true for all of us. And the first one is this, you may not be right with God, okay? God, prom God has lots of promises about prayer, but they're for his children. Not everybody. Not, here, I'm not saying God doesn't hear the prayers of everybody. I'm saying he has not obligated himself to, hear, to answer the prayers of everybody. Does that make sense? I told you last week I have four kids. They have a special claim on me, okay? And when you ask, that's one thing, but when they ask, it's different because they're my children, and so God says, maybe you're not right with me, but maybe that's what's going on. And a lot of commentators think this is really Jacob's conversion moment as he encounters God. And he said, God, I have to have your blessing. Now, he's been blessed by his dad. He stole that one. He's been blessed by a good wife. But he said, I have to have your blessing, God. I need this. This is what's most important. And so if your prayers aren't being answered, you need to ask the question, am I a child of God? Now, you do not become a child of God by going to church. That's a good thing. But that's not how, it's not how you become a child of God. John chapter 1, Jesus says about him, All who believed in Jesus accepted him. He gave them the right to become the children of God. So to become a child of God, you have to come to the place where you believe that Jesus is who he said he was, the Son of God, that he died for you in your place like we just celebrated in communion. You have to repent of your sins, turn away from that, and turn toward God. You have to be buried with Christ in baptism, and rise and walk a new life. Now, if you've never made the decision to give your life to Christ by faith, can I just say this honestly? You're praying to my dad, not yours. Hello, that got quiet in church, didn't it? And you, if, if you want to have access to the Father, you need to be his child. And so maybe you just need to ask yourself the question today, have, have I given my life to Christ and if not, man, this would be the day to do that. You can surely do that. Or maybe you think, well, I did that a long time ago, but my prayers still aren't being answered. Well, maybe, even though you're a Christian, you're still not right with God. And that is, you, 
there's something between you and God. There, there's some sin that you're harboring that, you know, you can't pray to God under an assumed name, right? I mean, you, you don't pray anonymously. He knows who you are. If you've got something wrong in your life, well, listen to what he says in Isaiah 59. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. Husbands, 1 Peter 3, treat your wives well, to her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. Husband, you ever think about that? Maybe the reason you have a hard time in prayer is because you're not treating your wife like she ought to be treated. Psalm 66, if I had not confessed the sins in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So sin can be an obstacle that keeps me from God, keeps me from prayer. What do you do about that? Well, if you're a Christian, the Bible says, 1 John 1, 9, confess your sins. He is faithful and righteous. He'll forgive you. Get rid of the obstacle. Apologize for what's between you. Get that out of the way. Then you have access to God. So maybe the, that wasn't a happy point, was it? Maybe the reason you're having trouble with prayer is because you're not, not right with God. Maybe the trouble is you've not prayed long enough. Jacob wrestled all night with God, said, God, would you bless me? You know, a high school wrestling match, you know how long they wrestle in high school one, one round? Two minutes. Two minutes. And that's a... By the way, that's a long time. I don't think, if I had to wrestle you for two minutes, I would wait for the guy to go, bam, you're done, I'd be out. Hit the mat, take me home. I don't, I don't to wrestle two minutes, it's all out, excruciating, put all you have into it. Right? All night long, Jacob wrestled with this man. And he finally says, I will not let you go until you bless me. I want, why do I need to pray longer? Well, sometimes God uses the delay to change something in me. James chapter 4, verse 2. You don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. You don't pray. And when you do pray, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. J.D. Greer says it's like this. We, sometimes we, we pray with wrong motives. It's like, it's like praying like an adulterer. And then he gives this example. Just imagine a man saying to his wife, when we got married, you pledged to meet my romantic needs, didn't you? And she looks at him like, uh, this is going to be bad. <laughs> and she said, okay. And he said, well, I've discovered my romantic need is this. I need you to set me up with your friend Katie for a date. That would meet my romantic needs. Now, how do you think she's going to respond to that? She signed up to, to be the one who meets those needs, not the one who sets it up. Hear this. God wants to be the one who meets your needs. And sometimes we pray to God, we're, we're more after God's blessings than we are after God himself. And so sometimes we got to keep on praying till we get to the point where we want God more than the blessings that we want from God. I don't know if that makes any sense or not. We pray like adulterers. God's highest purpose is for us to be like him. Romans chapter 8, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him or called according to his purpose for them. Here's his purpose. God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son. And so sometimes we wait, we keep on praying. God doesn't answer because he wants us to change while we pray. Or maybe, here's a third one, maybe you just don't understand God's greater plan. You often give your kids what they should get, not what they want to get. You take a 16-year-old boy who gets a driver's license and says, Dad, I'd like to have a, a brand new Corvette. By the way, those are a little pricey. And Dad says, you know what? You don't need a brand new Corvette. You need something a little bit slower. Just for the sake of everybody in town, you need something a little slower. That's how that works. We pray, Jesus taught us to pray, your will be done. And ultimately, that is a way better thing. Let me give you an example. The Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, prayed that God would take away this thorn he had in his flesh, this physical obstacle. And God said, quit praying about that. I, you're going to have that thorn, but my grace is sufficient. My power is perfected in weakness. It's better for the kingdom, better for you that you have the thorn than if you don't. And that's hard to get. How about this one? Luke chapter 1 says this. The angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah, the priest. God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son, and you're to name him John. Now, this is uh, John the Baptist we're talking about. And the angel says, guess what, Zechariah, your wife's going to have a baby. Now, Luke 1, 7 says, Zechariah and Elizabeth were both very old. Now, I'm old, but I'm not very old. Please help me. I'm not very old. But they were, I, I, so I don't, I don't know what very old is, but I know it's not this age. 
Okay, I had to be, had to be older than this because I'm not very old. Now, I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm going to. I, I, I think they had to be at least 75. Now, I remember they didn't live as long back then as we do now. I'm, 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 I'm in trouble, I know that. But I'm just... Uh, if they were very old at 75, and the angel said, look, God has heard your prayer. Do you think at 75, Zechariah's praying that his wife will have a baby? Do you think so? I think when he was 20, he said, God, give us a baby. I think when he's 30, he's still praying for a baby. I think when he was 40, if he was faithful, he said, God, it's getting late. <laughs> we could really use a baby. I think by the time he was 50, I don't think they do much praying about babies. And I think by the time he's 75, it's the last thing on his mind. And God says, I've heard your prayer. And God's answer to prayer was way better than he thought it would be. God had a better plan. He always has a better plan. Romans chapter 11 says this, Who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? God, you're going to like this. God is smarter than I am. And he's stronger than I am. Yeah, hello. God is smarter than you are. He's stronger than you are. You know how strong I am? What do you think? I, I, I tell you how strong I am. I cannot lift my mattress over my head. Can you? If you're sleeping in a twin bed, you might be able to. I cannot lift my mattress over my head. But God holds the world in existence. God made it and spoke, spoke it into existence with a word. With a flick of a finger, he can knock a hip out of socket. He is stronger than I am. And he's smarter than I am. And if he is as much smarter than I am as he is stronger than I am, it's no wonder I don't understand what he's doing all the time, but I, gotta, I have to believe God has a greater plan. I want to go with that. His wisdom exceeds ours. Here's a fourth possibility. Maybe it's because God does not often rewrite the rules. Sometimes we pray for God to overturn the processes that he's established and around the world. Those are natural laws. And we do pray for miracles, and they do happen, but they are rare. How about this, you? Ever pray for a sports team to win? I'm just waiting for you to hold your hands up. Just to hold your hand. If you've prayed for a team to win, you pray for a shot to go in. Anybody? Just go. I, I need hands. Yes. Yes. Any, anybody? I used to pray. I used to pray during free throws. Anybody? Nobody else? That's why you can't shoot. No, I, no, I prayed during free throws. But my problem was we could never beat the Catholics. Because in my little town, the Catholic cheerleaders would pray during free throws, and they would say, angel, angel, on the rim, please don't let that ball go in. <laughs> so I got no chance. Now, honestly, the team that wins the game is usually a team that has the best athletes and best trained. Rarely is it because somebody's praying harder on one team than another, right? I, I, I really don't expect God to swat the free throw out of the way. I don't expect that. God doesn't often rewrite the rules. And so we pray things like, God save all the Muslims. By the way, every Muslim has a soul that's precious to God. Hello? Every Muslim has a soul that's precious to God. And we pray, God save, the Muslims, save all the Muslims in Afghanistan. And God is for that. But he's established a natural process whereby the church sends people and people preach the gospel, people hear the gospel, and then they choose to respond to it. And God seldom violates the sending principle and the preaching principle, and he, he never violates the free will principle. And so you can pray about those things, and you should pray about that, but you probably ought to pray more about the church sending people and people going and, and preaching and people being responsive than you are about God doing a miracle to bring people to faith. Or we pray, God, please deliver from Deliver me from this hardship. I'm tired of this. Acts 14 says, they encourage them to continue in the faith, reminding them that we must suffer many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And Romans 1, chapter 5, you can read that. You can read James chapter 1. Both those chapters talk about that when we have these hardships, it produces endurance, and it goes on, and these are good things. And we want to short circuit the process, and God doesn't often do that. Here's the last reason, probably the most unsatisfying one of all. Uh, maybe it's just not time yet for God to answer your prayer. Somebody said God answers prayer four ways. Yes, no, wait, and you got to be kidding me. 
But often the wait one is the worst. And many prayers that we pray for relief from suffering will be answered later in eternity. Revelation chapter 5. When he took the scroll, the four living beings and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they held gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. In that day, God will answer the prayers that wipe away the tears. The broken relationships, the broken bodies will all be fixed then. And we pray and we wait. Now, so I've given you some reasons why maybe God hasn't answered your prayer yet. Hear this, most importantly. Here's what an unanswered prayer does not mean. It does not mean, it cannot mean that God has forsaken you. That's not what it means. The most famous unanswered prayer, the biggest unanswered prayer of all, was in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus said, Lord, please let this cup pass from me. And God did not answer yes to that prayer. In fact, Jesus was forsaken, so you never will be. So when, when you don't get what you think you want, just know that God is on the throne, God is wise, and it's not because he doesn't love you. In fact, Romans 8 says this, God did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all. Won't he also with him give us everything else? The cross is proof. You can trust God with your prayers. I don't know how he's going to respond, but I know you can lay him at his feet, and you can trust him to do the best thing. Let's pray together. Well, this whole... Uh, idea of prayer is it's hard for us and we, we pray and we expect and sometimes you don't do what we ought to and it's easy for us in those times to, to doubt whether you're going to do anything or whether we, you really care father help us to remember again the cross and what you've done for us to be reminded of how much you care and father help us to keep on praying faithfully knowing it makes a difference in jesus name we pray amen next sunday do my prayers really change anything? Does God ever change his mind when I pray? Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. I have a few announcements for you. The first being our first After Hours is on September 16th. If you are interested in helping out and hanging out with the high schoolers, then please sign up in the lobby or foyer or welcome center. I'm not sure what we call it. Guess what? Our first Super Wow is this Wednesday. We're so excited about it. Please join us at 5.30 for food, and then the actual service will begin at 6.30. There will be programming this Wednesday for K through 3rd, and then on September 14th, there will be programming for K through 8th. Make sure to join us at Super Wow. High school programming will begin on Sunday, September 11th. If you are in high school, be sure to join us from 6 to 8 at the Legion. It's going to be an awesome time. If you are wanting our college students to feel connected to their church family and community, Jill Loxton is getting together a group of people to send cards and care packages to our college students. If you want to get involved, contact Jill. Her information is in the bulletin. And that's all I got for you guys this week. Remember, the sermon notes are on the YouVersion Bible app, and you can follow along there. And go enjoy your tequilas or taco or Subway or your mom's food, whatever. Have a good rest of your Sunday.